The angel said to the shepherds, Behold, I bring you good news. The good news about Christmas is not just that Jesus came to us or that He makes a way to heaven for us. The good news about Christmas is that Jesus is the way to real life. He is the way to true joy and the way to lasting peace. The good news about Christmas doesn't just affect our eternity. It can change our today because Jesus was the way in a manger. Well, my son uh, Jonah must have been in the fifth or sixth grade when we were having our most memorable game of horse. You know what horse is, right? It's a basketball game where you try to match each other's shot. And if one person makes a shot and then you miss it, you earn a letter. You start with H and you go all the way through E. Once you spell horse, you end up losing the game. Well, Jonah had never once beaten me in horse, not one time. So this time he wanted some extra motivation and he said, dad, if you beat me or if I beat you, will you give me $5? I decided to one up him and I said, but if you beat me, I'll give you all the money in my wallet. He was like, are you serious? Like all of your money, I'm pretty sure I said something cocky, like you're not going to win anyway, so what does it matter, right? So those are called famous last words, by the way, foreshadowing and in storytelling. So, so we start our game, and Jonah was on fire. Like kid was not missing anything, every bucket, every bank shot, every trick shot going in. And for the most part, I was matching him bucket for bucket. But as the game progressed, he kept on adding letters to me. I kept on missing shots. He got me all the way to S, one more letter, and he would beat his dad for the very first time. All through the game, he was saying, as he was getting more letters on me, he was saying, Dad, I've never beat you before. I've never beat you before. I've never beat you before. And trust me, I was not letting him win. Like, I'm, I'm a competitive person. I don't let my kids win at anything. I don't let them win at Candyland, Go Fish, or Horse. Can I get a witness from all the competitive people in the room today? Just put it on the comments if you're competitive and you're watching online. So I was not letting him win, but he was doing awesome. Finally, he made a shot that I knew was going to be really tough to, to make. He was giddy as he watched me line this thing up. So, so I, I got lined up. I locked it in. I let it fly. And before I finish the story, it might help some of you to know who I am if you don't know. <laughs> My name is Jeff Manis. I am the lead pastor here. And uh, I am so glad uh, that all of you are here, both here in person and joining us online as well. If you are online, uh, I want to continue challenge you, challenging you. Once you're able and allowed to be here in person, uh, we want you here. Like this avenue is great for a season, but it was never meant to be a substitute for God's church. So once you're able to be here, uh, we encourage you and challenge you to be here. And to those of you who are in this 1230 service right now, thank you, thank you, thank you for choosing this service. This is one of the bigger uh, crowds we've had at 1230. And by, by choosing to be here, you are literally opening up seats in our other more popular uh, services. And we're able then to keep the whole physical distancing thing going. And we're able to, to reach more people with our vision, which our vision is for everybody. We exist to guide people to experience life to its fullest, connect into meaningful relationships and make a lasting impact. That's true for you. It's true for you online as well. And once again, whenever you're ready and able to be here. We, we would love to have you here in person. There's nothing like being with God's people in God's house. Jonah was giddy as he watched me line up this shot. Uh, I got settled. I locked it in. I, I let it fly and clang off the rim. It goes. I missed the shot and Jonah beat his dad for the very first time in church. He lost his ever loving mind. He was running around that school playground screaming, I won, I won. I can't believe I won. He pulled his shirt over his head, did the soccer thing. Ole, 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 ole. I beat you, dad. I beat you. You went down. I don't know where he learned to rub it in like that. <laughs> I'm just going to be honest. It was probably his mother. It's church. We should be honest. It was probably, it was probably his, his mother. And then he realized, 
And, and then he realized what, what I had was not going to remind him of. He was like, hey, you owe me all the money in your wallet. I was like, you're right. And being the man of, uh, man of my word like I am, I, I took out my wallet, opened it up, and revealed to him what many of you might guess is the case. The wallet was empty. I know, I'm a horrible parent. I honestly did not think he would beat me. That's why I even did it in the first place. But the wallet was empty. And immediately his countenance changed. He, here he was, so full of joy at, at this accomplishment of not just beating his dad, but now I get all the money in his wallet. All of that work, all of the energy, all the times he practiced, all the, all the, all the hours he put in wanting to beat his dad. And this time he did everything right. And what did he get? Nothing. The wallet was empty. And friends, that's exactly how I feel so many of us respond when it comes to life and when it comes to God. We, we feel like we've done everything right. We, we work hard. We do the right things. We, we, we put in our time and effort. We try to be a good person. We pay our dues, but nothing seems to go right for us. We keep expecting God to, to open up the wallet and reward us with something that will give us joy, but the wallet of life is empty. Ever feel like the wallet of life is empty for you? For some of you, that might be the very reason why you've chosen not to believe in God, that it seems like um, he's holding out on you or held out on you or on somebody that you love, and it's caused you to question, to doubt, to not believe. And I get it. I do. I, I, I understand how life can throw us things that that can cause us to, to question, to doubt, to not believe in God. But I hope you know, I hope you know that the God that I serve, that we serve here at Element, our God is big enough to handle all of your questions, all of your doubts, even all of your unbelief. In fact, our God is so big that he loves you in your unbelief. And we're going to do our best to love you and honor you just the same because that's what God does for us. The reality is uh, most of us, if we're honest, we have struggled with this or we, or we do struggle with this in life. Our, our joy seems to rise and fall with our circumstances or successes, our surroundings. So often our, our level of joy is determined by how much we like what's going on in life right now. Ever been there before? The problem is when we live life that way, we will never have any consistency in our joy. And please, please hear me. I am not saying that God expects us to, to just accept everything in life without any feelings or emotions, that, that we can't be sad or upset or disappointed. We gotta put on this fake Christian smile all the time and pretend like everything is roses. That's not what I'm saying. But, but I do wanna be clear with us today that I believe there can be some consistency to our joy. That, that joy doesn't have to be bound to our circumstances and surroundings. Happiness is a feeling based on circumstances, but joy is a condition of the heart. And the best part about joy is this. You can be sad and still have joy, at least the kind of joy that God wants to give to us. It can be consistent. In fact, here's the big idea for today. If you want to write it down, you can. The consistency of my joy is determined by what's at the center of my heart. Isn't that good? The consistency of my joy is determined by what's at the center of my heart. And listen, before you start believing that this kind of joy is not for you, like think again, uh, we're in our Christmas sermon series here called The Way in a Manger. And even in the Christmas story, we see that this joy is actually for everyone. When the angels appeared to the shepherds outside of Jerusalem and announced to them that the Messiah, Jesus, God in the flesh was born, which is where we started last week if you want to get caught up. The angel said this, Luke 2, 10 and 11. Don't be afraid, he said. I bring you good news that will bring great joy to all people. So this joy is for all. The Savior, yes, the Messiah, the Lord, has been born today in Bethlehem, the city of David. The, the joy that arrived with Jesus is available to everyone, to us all. We all have access 
to the joy. The consistency of my joy is determined by what's at the center of my heart. So here's the big question we have to ask. What should be at the center of my heart? If that's where the consistency of my joy is, what should be at the center? Only two verses for our main scripture today, Philippians 4, verses 4 and 5, but they, they pack a punch, if you will. Uh, Philippians is in the New Testament portion of the Bible, and if you don't own a Bible, uh, you can actually, a couple of free options for you, you can download a free one called Version to your mobile phone or, or uh, device. Uh, it's completely free. It's a great, great Bible app. Or if you're here in person and want an actual copy of a Bible, we'll get you one free of charge. Just ask for one at guest services on your way out. Philippians might contain the most powerful teaching on joy in the, all the Bible because of where Philippians was written from. Paul, we call him the Apostle Paul in Christian circles, he wrote Philippians and he wrote it from a prison cell where he was imprisoned for his faith in Christ. He had been dealt an empty wallet, if you will. And if anyone deserved a full wallet, it was Paul. I mean, after putting his faith in Christ, Paul committed his life to telling other people about Jesus. He started dozens of churches throughout the Roman world. He led countless people to Christ, and he would go on to write two-thirds of the New Testament portion of the Bible. And what did Paul get in return? (laughs) Prison for his faith in, in Christ. And writing from a prison cell where Paul would eventually die in prison, Paul writes these words, The first part of verse four of Philippians four says this, always be full of joy in the Lord. Always be full of joy in the Lord. The consistency of my joy is determined by what's at the center of my heart. So what should be at the center of my heart? The first thing we see is this, the right person. The right person has to be at the center of our heart. And if you want consistency in your joy, that person can't be you, and it can't be anyone else. It can only be Jesus. Notice where Paul said we should be full of joy. He he didn't say be full of joy in your circumstances or surroundings, not in your successes or celebrations, not in a full wallet or an empty one. Paul said always, Whether you're in prison or in the penthouse, be full of joy in the Lord. That Jesus is the way to true joy because Jesus is the way in a manger. King David wrote something similar in Psalm chapter 9, verses 1 and 2. Psalm 9, 1 and 2 says this, I will praise you, Lord, with all my heart. I will tell of all the marvelous things you have done. I will be filled with joy because of what? You. Not filled with joy because of what's happening around me. Not filled with joy because of what's happening to me. Not even filled with joy because of what you give me, God. I'm filled with joy because of you and you alone. Timothy Keller, who's a pastor of a church in New York City, author of several books, brilliant theologian, he said this. He was speaking about identity, which is at the center of who we are. He said, if anything threatens your identity, your center, you will not just be anxious but paralyzed with fear. If you lose your center through the failings of someone else, you will not just be resentful but locked into bitterness If you lose your center through your own failings, you will hate or despise yourself as a failure as long as you live. Only if your center is built on God and his love can you have a self that can venture anything, face anything. Isn't that good? So I'm going to ask our staff to come out today and help me illustrate this. And as they're getting ready, I'm going to set this up for us. Uh, I do owe this illustration to my best friend, Todd. It was, it was his idea in his heart and mind. We're just bringing it to life today uh, on the platform. Todd kind of shared what was on his mind and heart that we're kind of walking through here several months ago to me, but it stuck with me. And when I was planning this message, I thought this was a great place to share it. Life is full of things that seek to pull us off of our center 
Uh, Pastor Keller mentioned things people do to you or things you do to yourself. It's, it's things that are in our control and things that are out of our control. So, so imagine with me for the next few minutes, if you will, that the length of this stage is the length of our life. And we each are individually moving from one end to the other in life. And in life, we always have things that try to pull us off of our center. Now, for our illustration, these, these words we have up high here, they are not necessarily emotional highs in a positive sense. Uh, these are things that, that they, they do raise our emotions, but they, they are the things that cause anxiety, fear, worry, bitterness, whatever it is. They're, they're things outside of our control. We have, we have pain and we have problem, which is kind of funny. I've got to share this. This sign became a problem for Corinne, who's holding it here. She made all the signs because she, it was supposed to say problems. And two different times, she got all the way to the M and there was no room for the S. On the other side, you can see where she tore off the letters the first time. And she was so angry. She texted me to come see her. She said, I'm so mad. I can't get the word problems. I said, just leave it. It's ironic. This sign became a problem for you. It's making you angry. It's increasing your heart rate, causing tension. That's what these do. Pain, problems, and betrayal. These, these are outside of our control. They cause tension. They increase the heart rate. They raise our emotions. And then we have things in our control. Sin, self-image, failures. We, we all experience these things, and they're constantly trying to pull us off center. So imagine then, if you will, that this cord here, this rope, represents your center. If your center is not secure, and you go through life experiencing these things, it's going to be a wild ride. Like we all are going to experience pain in life, physical pain, emotional pain, relational pain, whatever it is, it's outside of our control. And when we experience it or when we're threatened by it, increase that heart rate, the tension goes up, anxiety, fear, worry, whatever it is. And then we have to have sin. Unfortunately, we choose to sin. Sometimes we choose to sin again and again and again. We feel worthless and shameful and condemned we did it ourselves, but we, we start beating ourselves up about it. And then we have problems, physical problems, financial problems, worldwide pandemics, heard of that? <laughs> uh, job problems, relational problems, again, things outside of our control that are brought against us. But then we have this in our control. We have self-image problems. We say, say things like, God could never use me. I could never do what that person does. They're so much more gifted than I am, or God made a mistake. Or even, even the, the common things that we struggle with, just with our physical appearance, I'm fat, I'm ugly, whatever it is. We, we have these self-image things that we, we deal with that pull us down. And then this one might be the hardest one to deal with. It's betrayal. It's, it's people that we trust and love that, that broke that trust, hurt us, betrayed us whatever it is, and we experience that, and we're like, is it, is it my fault? Did, did I do something wrong? Are they going to do it again? <gasps> that emotion goes up. And then we have failures. We, we attempt something new. We, we try something new. We, we step out in faith, take a risk, and we don't do it the right way. We fail, and now we're just beating ourselves up again. I'm worthless. I'm useless. I'm no good. Like, if, your, if your center is not secure, that's what your life looks like. <laughs> Riding the wave of every emotion, up and down, up and down, up and down. Even if we replace these signs up here with positive words like provision, pleasure. If they're positive things and our center's not secure, we're just riding the wave, man. Up and down, up and down. So Todd told me, that's why we need a center line. And our center line is Jesus. So guys, help me out with the center line. Please don't pull it up while I straddle it. That would be a problem. So we have this here, gonna represent our, our center line. You can go ahead. And, and let me just say this, even if Jesus is your center line, even if he's at the center of your heart, it doesn't stop these things from happening, does it? Just anybody who tells you that when you put your faith in Jesus, you'll no longer experience these things, they're lying. In fact, sometimes we experience more of this. So just because your faith is in Jesus doesn't mean you won't experience pain or problems or betrayal or sin or self-image or failure struggles. Like those still happen. 
But, but Todd then told me, he said, but I'm going to use this carabiner for us now. If, if, I'm, if I'm locked on to Jesus, when I'm locked on to Jesus as my center, when my center is secure, I, and I go through life, I'm still going to experience all those things, but the pull is not quite as strong. I'm not riding that up and down, up and down, up and down wave. I still will have hurt and pain and problems and loss and all those things, but I'm not so swayed by it. In fact, it got me thinking that, that if this carabiner was, was us clinging to Jesus, that when we go through life with Jesus as our center, it looked more like this. You might still have some ups and downs, right? But you're not doing that sweeping this. The consistency of my joy is determined by what's at the center of my heart. And when Jesus is at the center, I have so much more consistency in my joy. Isn't that good? Thanks, ladies and guys, for your help. So one of the reasons that we can so easily live our lives without joy or live our lives on the roller coaster of joy is because we don't have the right person at the center of our heart. For beginners, it might just be you've not put your faith in Jesus. Start there. Which, by the way, I don't know how anyone navigates life without Jesus. I just can't figure it out. There's so much that comes our way that we talked about, and we only listed six things. But even, even as Christians, like we might believe in and follow Jesus, but, but if he's not the center, if, if you have, you, some of us have Jesus as our Savior, but not as our Lord. And when he's not your Lord, when you've not surrendered the throne of your heart to Jesus and you or something or someone else is on that throne, you're gonna ride the wave of whatever that thing is. You're gonna ride the wave. And when someone or something else is that center of your heart, your joy or lack thereof will rise and fall with whatever happens to them or whatever they do in life. But when Jesus is our center line, it doesn't matter what anyone else does, what happens to me or what happens around me, my joy can be consistent because Jesus is the right person at the center of my heart. So now in my life, in Todd's life, on a regular basis, when, when one of us is having a bad day, things aren't going our way, we start to sense that something is pulling us off of that, that center line, pulling us away from, from real joy. We will actually say to ourselves out loud, we'll say it to each other, we'll text one another these words, Jesus is my center line. Jesus is my center line. I've actually made it one of my regular declarations of truth that I speak over my life, especially on those days where I start feeling like I'm being pulled off center. I will say out loud, Jesus is my center line. Why? Because everything else, all those other things I experience that are trying to tell me my joy is found there, that's a lie. And the only way to defeat lies is with the truth. So when I start feeling the lie that my joy is based on any other thing but Jesus, I just say it out loud, Jesus is my center line. You'll be amazed how fast that pulls you back center when you acknowledge that. The consistency of my joy is determined by what's at the center of my heart. So what should be at the center of my heart? The right person, Jesus, the way to true joy, the way in a manger, number two, is this, the right posture. The right posture. Philippians 4, all of verse 4 now, I'm going to read the whole thing, says this. Always be full of joy in the Lord. I say it again, rejoice. If you grew up like I did, uh, learning the King James Version of the Bible, uh, the King James Version says, rejoice in the Lord always. I say it again, rejoice. And if you grew up on the King James Version, you might have also grown up like me in old school Sunday school, where that verse just reminded you of a song. And yes, I'm singing the song. 
It goes like this. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Yes, yeah, somebody said rejoice. Somebody clapped. It can be both. In, in the way we did it, at the end of that line, we would all scream, rejoice. It was the one time in church I could scream and not get in trouble with the pastor, who was also my dad. And let me tell you, it doesn't go well all the time. When your dad is the pastor, just ask my kids. They will vouch for that as well. The word rejoice there that Paul uses when he says, I say it again, rejoice. The word rejoice that Paul uses, writing in the Greek that he was in, is the Greek word kairo, which means leaning into or delighting in God's grace. More literally, it means to experience God's grace and be constantly thankful for it, constantly glad for it. That, that simply because of God's grace, there is always a reason to praise. That'll preach right there, so I'll say it again. That simply because of God's grace, there is always a reason to praise. That my posture, the posture of, of the center of my heart can and should be a posture of praise. That yes, I will still experience pain and problems and failures and betrayal and sin and self-image, whatever it is, just like everyone else, but I'm gonna lean into God's grace. I'm experiencing his grace in Jesus and I'm constantly glad for it. And remember where Paul wrote this from, prison. So if Paul can rejoice in prison, then I can rejoice in my problems too. Come on. If Paul can rejoice in prison, then I can rejoice in my problems too. Not rejoicing for my problems, but rejoicing in my problems. Rejoicing's a choice. That's why Paul said, I say it again, rejoice. I'm gonna lean into God's grace and be constantly glad for it. The consistency of my joy is determined by what's at the center of my heart. So what should be at the center? The right person, the right posture. Then verse five, Paul says this. Let everyone see that you are considerate in all you do. Remember, the Lord is coming soon. And you read that, I don't know about you, but I'm like, what the what? Like, what in the world does that mean, right? It's almost like Paul completely shifts gears and talks about a totally unrelated subject from joy. I know pastors can do that very easily, but what does that have to do with joy? Well, that phrase, be considerate in all you do, is actually not talking about, it's not talking about being kind or polite. We should be kind and polite, by the way, especially as Christians. Can I lean in there for a second? Like, for some of us, Social media specifically is ruining your Christian witness because you are neither kind nor polite in what you say and how you respond. So either start being kind and polite or stop calling yourself a Christian. Something's got to change. So I pressed in. That's not even what it's talking about. We should be kind and polite, especially as Christians, but that's not what it's talking about. The pulpit commentary helps us out with this explanation about that phrase, be considerate in all you do. It stands for the attitude which contents itself with less than it is due and shrinks from insisting on its strict rights. Wish I could camp out there for a while. There is no joy in a narrow selfishness. Joy involves an open heart and a generous love. Joy in the Lord tends to make us gentle, mild, and generous to others. Why? Because Jesus was gentle, mild, and generous to others. So the third thing we've got to keep at the center of our hearts is this. Number three, the right pursuits. The right pursuits. And what are those pursuits? An attitude which contents itself with less than it is due and shrinks from insisting on its strict rights. It is gentle, mild, and generous to others. I wanna focus on that last part, generous to others, for sake of time. This past week, we got a prayer request submitted through the form that's on our, our website from a mom who's going through a divorce. 
She was asking for prayer for financial provision. She did not ask us for money, just ask for prayer for financial provision because she did not know if she'd be able to provide Christmas for her children as they were going through this divorce. Only an hour or so, it's probably less, but I'm gonna say max an hour after I had that prayer request come across my desk, I got a, desk, a text from one of our volunteers. They actually served today and they simply asked this question, here it is word for word. Do you know of anyone in the church who might need some help in the form of cash? The timing was more than perfect, it was divine. So I immediately thought of that woman, I, I told this volunteer uh, about it, and within minutes, they, they stopped by the church and dropped off $500 in cash for this person. We contacted the mom to have her come by the church. We didn't tell her what was going on when she came by. I was not there for this, but I was told that when we told her what happened and presented her with that money, she literally just melted. Melted. At the open heart and generous love of this person who she will never meet probably. They don't know each other, I don't think. But blown away by this one person who just listened to the prompting of the Holy Spirit had a generous heart, generous love, and gave to her in need. Friends, there's a reason why Jesus said, as recorded in Acts 20, verse 35, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Because Jesus knows generosity is one of the ways we keep the consistency of our joy. It takes the focus off of us and puts it on other people. It's the right pursuit. That the consistency of my joy is determined by what's at the center of my heart. So what should be at the center? The right person, Jesus, God in the flesh, came as one of us, died because of us, rose from the dead, and by faith in him, I can be forgiven, but not just forgiven, be filled with joy. I gotta have the right posture, a posture of praise even in my problems, not for them, but in them. And I gotta have the right pursuits. I mean, if Jesus is at the center, those pursuits will come out, I promise you. An open heart and generous love. Isn't that what Jesus showed us? The most radical act of generous love ever in the history of humanity was Jesus giving himself to us. And today, we have the chance to model that same generosity to people we may never meet. Today is the official start of the I Heart Wyoming year-end offering on every chair when you came in are some pledge cards. I want you to grab those if you would. If you're online, you can go to our Facebook page, face, uh, on Facebook, go to the church page, and then pinned to the top is a digital pledge card as well. If you're new with us, uh, your gift is your presence today. But if you want to give, if you call Element Church Home, I've been challenging us to all give something. We can all give something, all of us. Every single one of us can give something. I Heart Wyoming's our effort to elevate, expand, and reinforce the credibility of God's church all around our state. And you should see the things that have happened over the last several years as through your generosity, we've been giving money away to other churches and they've been using that money, resourcing them to serve their communities in tangible ways. Every single dollar given to the I Heart Wyoming offering above and beyond our normal givings, sacrificial gift, above and beyond any, anything we give, we put directly into our iHeart account and we give to them. If you want to give, you can, get, you can do that in all the regular ways, the push pay app, the giving page on the website, um, cash or check, just make sure you mark, uh, if you're online and doing it digitally, make sure and select iHeart Wyoming in the drop down. If you're gonna give in cash or check, make sure it's marked on the envelope or the check that it goes to iHeart Wyoming. And if you wanna make a pledge, this is the first year we're doing pledges. So we recognize that there are some people who would rather pledge an amount to give over the course of a year, just put it into their budget. You can use the, the pledge cards that we have there and make a pledge as well. If, you're, if you want your gift to be applied to your 2020 giving statement for tax purposes, you do need to have that turned in uh, by December 31st to make sure that applies. And again, every single dollar given, we give away to other churches in our state. It really is a way that we keep on the forefront the right pursuits for our church, leading the way in generosity. It's one of our core values that we serve a radically generous God, so we will be radically generous people. Generosity should be a, a hallmark characteristic of every Christian, should. 
My question to you though is not, not what will you give? <laughs> it's an important question, but the better question is this, have you received the generous love of God through Jesus? Have you put your faith in Jesus to forgive you of your sins? If you haven't, we'd love to talk to you about that. I will be here after the service right here on the platform. You can talk with me. You can talk to a prayer team member. If you're here in person, they'll be in the very back of the room. If you need prayer for anything or want to talk about anything, they'll be in the very back of the room at the purple tent back there and, and they'll, they'll talk with you, pray with you. Same online. Um, just click the prayer button if you're on the online platform. Um, call us, email us. We're here. We're available. We want to talk with you about what your needs are specifically about faith in Jesus. Next week, we're going to look at uh, Jesus as the way to lasting peace. I think the joy message and the peace message kind of go hand in hand. They're twins, if you will. And so it's going to be a great uh, tie-in to today's message. I want to close in prayer. Uh, before we do that, we're just going to take a couple seconds just to be silent. And I want you to either ask God, what are you, what are you saying to me in this message? Or it's your last chance really to say, Lord, what do you want to give through me to iHeart? And then I'll close in prayer and we'll be done. Jesus, you are so, so good to us. You literally could have left us in our mess. But in your love, you chose to come, to die, to rise again. So Lord, I pray for every one of us, this message will affect us differently. I pray that we'd respond appropriately by, by putting the right person at the center, by having a posture of praise, the right pursuits of, of this gentle, mild, generous love. And Lord, I pray if there's anybody who's seeking you right now on what they should give to, to you through I Heart Wyoming, I pray that you confirm that amount, that we be faithful to give. Lord, that you bless it, multiply it, and use it to impact this great state in which we live. Lord, we love you. We give you all praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Love you guys so much. We'll see you here next week. You're dismissed.